Okay, are you guys ready today? Yeah. We're jumping into our series called You Ask For It. Some are more ready than others, but that's what we like. That's what we like. We called You Ask For It because back in Easter of this year, we had a little bit of a survey where we give you an opportunity to mention some things that you would like to be uh, preached on, subjects you'd like to hear about, and uh, we thought it was a fun thing we would try and, and see how it worked out. And so we picked the top six things that people responded to, and last week we talked about purpose. We talked about finding your why, finding your cause, finding what God is speaking to you, and, and uh, we talked about that last week. Hope that encouraged you and spoke into your life. This week, one of the things that people want to talk about was stress and busyness. So the subtitle today is Stressed Out. Anybody feeling stressed out? You don't have to raise your hands, but either at different times in your life, we all feel the pressure of being stressed out, things going on in our life. So that's what we're going to address today. So if you've got your sermon notes and your Bible, let's get those out. Open up your Bibles to Luke chapter 2. Oh. Woo! Luke chapter 2. Let's start, uh, we're going to start reading in verse 39. Luke chapter 2. Stressed out, stressed out. This story that we're going to read here just cracks me up. There were so many things in it that really spoke to me, and, and I'm going to read it through the eyes of a parent. Some of you may or may not know that uh, Dawn and I, we have five children, and, and so some things that I'm reading through this story, I thought, wow, <laughs> I'm not sure I can preach about this. <laughs> I'm not just, there's so many things in the Bible that I think are humorous, and uh, some people don't appreciate my humor. I don't always appreciate my humor, but it's just how I see things. You know, there's some things that just strike me funny and strike me odd, so I just try to communicate it the best way I see it. So I'm going to focus in on the parental side of this story and hope that it speaks to you. Uh, let's look at verse 39. So when they had performed all the things according to the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee to their own city, Nazareth. And the child, the child is Jesus, the child grew, this is Jesus and his mom and dad, child grew and became strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. His parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. So every year, adult males or Jews are supposed to travel to Jerusalem three times a year, really, not just Passover, but for the Passover the Feast of Passover in the spring, the uh, Feast of Pentecost in May, and then the Feast of Tabernacles, which is in the fall. And so three times a year, the Bible, the, the law required them to make themselves present before God and to bring an offering. They were supposed to come. And so this year, the whole family's going, coming to Passover. And so in verse 42, it says, And when he was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem according to the custom of the feast. At 12 years age, of age, when we read this, we think, well, 12 is kind of a random thing. It's very important that we understand why 12 is mentioned, because in the Jewish culture, 12 years old was the age that young men were supposed to begin to come into their identity. They're supposed to begin to form a trade. They're supposed to figure out what they're supposed to do with their life. They were started to uh, be members in the church and get involved. They're supposed to begin to be trained in fasting and prayers. They became sons of the law or sons of the commandments. And all of this was happening at 12 years of age. And it began to change. Now Jews uh, do the bar mitzvah at 13 years of age. But in this culture back then, it was around the age of 12 is when all this began to happen. It began to find out who you are and what you're supposed to be doing. So this was the first year that Jesus was required to make the journey to Jerusalem. And I think it's very significant. You'll find out a little bit why. So verse 43, and when they had finished the days, this is seven-day festival, so they'd been there a week. When they had finished the days, as they returned, the boy Jesus, <laughs> I just like that, the boy Jesus. He was a child back here in verse 40, and now he's the boy. The boy, it's like the dad's writing this part of the story here. Some, the boy, Jesus, lingered behind in Jerusalem, and Joseph and his mother did not know it. Has anybody had a child linger behind when they were supposed to catch up? Have you ever had a child that just, you kind of misplaced somewhere <laughs> because they lingered when they were supposed to follow? You know, children are amazing creatures, and we all were children at one point or another. Sometimes we forget what we were like as children. I try to forget that as much as possible. But, but as a child, they, they linger behind. So this is the scenario we see that Jesus just lingered behind in Jerusalem. 
So just set yourself in the story. I'm going to put myself in the story because I want to relate to what's happening. I want to feel what they were feeling. I want to be able to express what God is saying here to all of us and see what we can talk about in the subject of stress and busyness. So his mom and dad didn't know it. So you're a mom and dad. You've got a 12-year-old kid, and uh, you don't know where they are. Verse 44, but supposing him to have been in the company, they went a day's journey. Now what it means is they used to travel uh, I won't say in herds, that's animals travel herds, but they, they used to travel together, a bunch of people at time, big festival, so everybody's leaving town. You know, it's like at the end of vacation in Panama City Beach or something, and everybody's trying to get out of town. This is the way it is at the end of the Feast of Passover. Everybody's leaving town, and even for safety's sake, they would travel, you know, in, in groups of people. And so they just assumed, it says here, that Jesus uh, they went about a day's journey, so they're a day traveling away from Jerusalem, and they sought him among their relatives and acquaintances. They assumed, you know, Jesus being the social butterfly that he was, that he was just mingling among the people. He was just talking. They assumed he was probably walking around praying for people or doing Messiah-type stuff, normal 12-year-old activities. Now, I don't know what they thought he was doing. They just assumed he was probably just walking around amongst their relatives and their friends, and so they thought, ah, he's with somebody. But he traveled a day, and all of a sudden, somebody, I'm assuming it was Mary, right, mothers? I'm assuming it was Mary that said, wait a minute, where's the boy? <laughs> Joseph probably had no idea that Jesus was even on the trip. I don't know. <laughs> well, now, I don't want to put us dads down, but I'm just saying, it was probably mama that said, should we look for him? He's fine. He's fine. He's back there with Uncle Joe. He's fine. He's fine. He's back there. No, let's look for him. So I'm sure Mary said, hey, uh, uh, Joseph, we better check it out. So verse 46, or verse 45, sorry. So when they did not find him amongst the relatives, they returned to Jerusalem seeking him. And this part just jumped out at me because they lost Jesus. So they decided to go back and look for him where they last saw him. Parents, have you ever had a child come up to you and say, I've lost such and such. I can't find it. And you say to them, where did you last see it or have it? Or where, where did you have it last? Where did you see it last? And so that's a wonderful question, we think, until they get about 12 years of age or a little bit older, and they start talking back with some wisdom, and they say, if I knew that, I wouldn't have lost it. But you know, they say stuff like this. So you, they lost Jesus. So it says that they went back to Jerusalem looking for him. Here's what I want to throw in. If you've lost Jesus somewhere along the way in your life, all you have to do is go back where you last saw him. Go back to where you had your relationship last. Go back to where you were close to him last. I'm telling you, sometimes we got to leave where we are. If we can't see Jesus where we are, leaving where we are is more important than staying where we are. If I've got to leave where I am to go find Jesus, then I need to leave where I am. Sometimes people are so enamored with their surroundings and their friends. And I, I know I'm not, I can't see Jesus with these current friends, but, but I can't leave them. They're my friends. Finding Jesus is always is more important than where you're looking right now. So just start looking for him. And if you're like, I can't find him, I've lost him, go back to where you saw him last and renew that relationship with him. So important, so important. So let's go on, verse 46. And so now, so it was after three days. <laughs> All right, so now I'm, pick, I'm putting myself in here as a parent. I traveled a day. After three days of looking for him, so a day's journey back, three days looking for him, four days without your child. As a parent, imagine your feelings, four days without your 12-year-old son. So look at that, what happened. Four days later, they, they found him in the temple at church. And I'm assuming if you lost your child, finding them in the church is a great place to find them. But still, there's something about when you don't know where they are, it could cause a little bit of stress. So it says, they found him in the temple in the midst of the teachers, both listening to them and asking them some questions. So here he is, 12 years old. And, and you could talk about this angle, about the incredible uh, wisdom and stuff that Jesus had at 12 years old, that he's in here talking to the doctors and the teachers and, and giving them questions. There. You know, we could go that angle, but I want to stay today on the parent's side. Yes, it's incredible what Jesus was doing at 12, but for our story, I want to focus on the characters that are doing the searching. 
So they found him there in verse 47, and all who heard him were astonished, astonished at his understanding and answers. Notice the people that Jesus was with, were with the, he, the people that he was with, all of them were astonished at Jesus' answers. But I want to wonder, how did the parents feel? Four days, mind you. Look at verse 48. So when they saw him, they were amazed. Amazed, really? I begin to think as a parent, and then I begin to think as a child, that if I'd been missing for four days and not told my parents where I was, would they be amazed? <laughs> when they finally found me, would they be like, wow, there you are. So I looked up what the word amazed means, and God began to give me some revelation. The word amazed is a Greek word that means to strike with astonishment. And I said, aha, I understand now. Because if I'd been missing for four days and not told my parents where they were, when they found me, there would be some striking going on. <laughs> but I don't think it would be with astonishment. <laughs> no doubt about it, some striking would be involved. So this is what was happening. They were amazed <laughs> when they saw him. <laughs> well, there you are, little sugar booger. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure that's what they said. So look at the next sentence. Here it starts to come out, all right? So now they were amazed and Mama Bear starts speaking. You know Mama, <laughs> Mama's a little bit fired up. I have a picture in my mind that Joseph was more the quiet type. Not a lot written about him in the Bible, but, uh, but Mama begins to speak. And this whole interaction right here reminds me of a, of a Bill Cosby skit when I was a kid that I used to listen to. But, but it knows what she says. And Mother said to him, now recognize she's talking to her son. This is Mary is not talking to the Messiah. She's not talking in her mind right now. She's talking to her 12-year-old son who's been lost, who did not tell her where he was. She didn't come back to him and go, oh, there you are, Jesus. Oh, there you are. That's not what's happening here. I want you to see what's happened. She goes, son? <laughs> whenever, whenever my dad called me son, that wasn't a good day. Son? Why have you done this to us? <laughs> Picture Mary. Son, <laughs> why have you done this to us? <laughs> she, goes, she goes on. She says, look. Look at me. Look, look at me when I'm talking to you. That's what she's saying. Boy, you better look at your mama. That's just what I get out of the story. I don't know if you get that out of it. says, look, your father and I. You know, Joseph's over there like, dude, why are you bringing me into this? You know, you know how a parent can't handle it by themselves. we got to bring the other one in for support. It's, look at me, your father. Joseph, pay attention over here. Look at me. Right? <laughs> your father and I have sought you anxiously. Anxiously. Now, is there a problem that they were looking for their lost son? I don't think there's any problem with that. And any good parent would go looking for their kid. Is a lost child a bit of a problem? Yeah. I think, I think it's an issue. Something worth addressing. <laughs> if you haven't seen your child in four days, you might want to go looking for them <laughs> after service. So now, but I'm just saying, <laughs> I'm just joking. <laughs> but it's a problem, right? It's a significant problem. So in the response, look what happens. We've sought you anxiously. And he said to them, verse 49, <laughs> he said to them, why did you seek me? <laughs> you little 12-year-old, what a wonderful answer. <laughs> why did you seek me? Why did you seek me? See, I don't think the problem is that they sought him. I think the problem is how they sought him. It says they sought him anxiously. I give you the definition of that word anxiously. Let's check it out. It means to grieve, to torment, to experience great distress or anxiety, anxiety to, be, to be terribly worried. Seeking him was not the problem. How they sought him was the problem. They were distressed. They were worried. I might say, you might say, well, it's totally understandable 
They haven't seen their child. They've lost him. And all these worries, these fears, something could be wrong with him. He could be, di- could be dead, could be stolen, you know, could be whatever. You know, whatever could happen to a child, all these fears are coming at you. But in this moment, I think the problem is not that they sought him, but it's how they sought him because he gives them some direction. And, he, you know, I think the proper response would have been this. He would have been, Mom, I am so sorry. <laughs> That's the answer as a parent I want to hear. I just want to hear, I'm so sorry, Mom. Did Jesus give that answer? No. What's he give? He gives his answers. Why did you seek me? Did you not know that I must be about my father's business? Verse 50, but they did not understand the statement which he spoke to them. No kidding. (laughs) I wouldn't understand that statement either. My kid that I've been looking for for four days says, why did you seek me? I must be about my father's business. Oh, really? <laughs> Does not compute. Come here. You know, they, we, got, we have trouble understanding this. So I, I begin to put this together, and, and I want you to see something, because Jesus disobeying or obeying his father, I must be about my father's business, obeying the father was not disobeying his parents. Because remember, Jesus never sinned, ever. And one of the big ten, the top ten commandments, remember that? Honor your father and your mother and the Lord, for it will be well with you that you may have a long life. Amen. You have a long life. So if, if, a, if a commandment was honor your father and mother, did he honor his father and mother? Evidently, he always honored his father and mother because he never sinned. So we look at this story and we say, wait a minute, what's the issue here? What's going on? How come Jesus is so focused on this and so blasé, almost, if you will, about his parents worrying and being anxious and begins to speak to them? Do you know at 12 years of age, you're supposed to begin to find your trade, right? You're supposed to begin to find your purpose in life. Where did Jesus, where was he found at 12 years of age? He was found in that church. He was found in the temple reasoning over the word of God. He had found his green. It's like, Mama, why did you look for me? You know where I got to be. I got to be seeking my cause and my purpose. And my cause and my purpose is the Father's business. So when I read that, I began to think about, okay, as a parent, what do I want for my children? And again, it can be in all kinds of different areas, but I want to compare and contrast business, the Father's business versus busyness. Because if we're stressed out, would you agree with me that Mary was probably stressed out? (laughs) Look at me. Your father and I have been searching for you anxiously. Come here, come here, come here. All of that's going on, right? I believe she was a little bit stressed out. Understandable. I'm not, I'm not hating on Mary. But I'm just saying I think we need to learn something here. Because he said his response, you know, when you're, when you're the parent of the son of God, <laughs> you know, there's a little bit of interaction, a little bit different. But he began to give them a revelation truth at 12 that taught them about stress. He said, why did you seek me? That Greek word why literally could be translated to how. How did you seek me? In other words, why weren't you in tune with where I should be? Why were you not getting direction from the Father on where I should be? Because I'm in tune with the Father's business. You should have been in tune with the Father's business. Again, At that moment, I get it. I'm probably not thinking about those things either. But this is the direction he gave. So let's compare and contrast. Busyness versus busy. There's a difference in being about the father's business and being busy. Busyness just means full of activity. You're busy. Everybody's busy, right? Everybody's busy. You ask people, say, hey, how you doing? How's it been going? Busy. Awesome. Really? So, uh, but how are you? Busy. Busy. We have summarized our entire activity calendar into four letters. Busy. Hey, where you been? Haven't seen you. Oh, busy. Busy. Whew, I'm telling you what, I am busy. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) That's it. That's all we got. We're just busy. We justify everything in one one word. Busy. Man. You have no idea how busy I am. (laughs) Right? So we talk about being busy. I've got some sayings. Maybe you've heard some of these busy sayings. Because a lot of times being busy is just engaged in an action, but are we really doing anything? I've been busier than a long-tailed cat in a room full of rocking chairs. (laughs) 
Have you used that one? I mean, I'm busier than a desert cobra at a mongoose convention. <laughs> That's a tough one. I'm busier than a termite in a sawmill. Or I'm busier than a one tooth man in a corn on the cob eating contest. That's busy right there. That's busy. You're picturing it. You got, you're seeing it. <laughs> That's busy. That is busy. But you know, if we talk about, if we talk about something being busy like a design, like if you, if I would come up to you, and maybe not today, but if, if you walk up to someone and they say, boy, that shirt's really busy, they're probably not complimenting you. <laughs> because when we say something's busy, it means it has a bunch of distracting design, right? Boy, that picture is really busy. It doesn't mean that it's moving around. It means there's a lot of distracting design. And sometimes busyness is that we get distractions all the time from doing what we're supposed to be doing. Busyness means I'm distracted. We're, our world is full of distractions. Try and do anything for 30 minutes straight without checking your phone. Some of you start twitching. Is there a notification? Is there a notification? There is a notification on my phone! Someone has Snapchatted me. I've got to touch it, swipe it. Come on. I mean, it's distractions all the time. And it may not be that for you. It could be television. It could be whatever it may be. Do we not have a bunch of distractions? We got them. They're all over the place. But that's why I want to say there's a difference in the father's business and busyness. Because there's one, you'll see the difference between the two words but busyness is activity that's not initiated by the Father. So the difference between busyness and business is one letter. Busyness, Y, business with an I. I want to show you something that I got out of this. I don't know if it will speak to you or not. But busyness, the difference between those two, two words, both of them mean activity. The difference is who's initiating the activity. Busyness with a Y means you are initiating the activity. Business with an I means I am is initiating the activity. God is referred to as I am. And Moses, he said, hey, tell him, who should I say has sent me? He said, say, I am that I am sent you. So when the I am is initiating my activity, it's business. It's a, it's a proactive, it's a purposeful activity. It's a mission, it's an objective, it's a cause, it's a purpose. When I'm operating in the Father's business, that's what he was telling mom and dad. He said, listen, mom, I'm, I'm not busy as in as far as being busyness. I'm about my Father's business. This is what the Father is initiating me to do. So it's not necessarily bad things because the devil's strategy is to get you and I distracted in doing all kinds of things that are not our business. It's because business is a purposeful activity. It's a cause. It's something, a mission, an objective that God has put into your heart. And the best thing we can do to get rid of some stress in our life is to learn that some things are just not our business. You need to be able to say, hey, that's none of my business. And I know in the world of social media, it's very difficult now to wonder who uh, who's, believes that some things aren't their business or not. But we got to realize that busyness is the difference between me initiating the, the action, the things that I'm doing, versus God initiating those. I want to give you an example. Look in, in Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. Because if we're busy, if we're initiating the action, the activity, it will lead to worry and stress. We will get stressed out because we're initiating the activities. And look what Jesus' example is on how to deal with stress. Matthew 11, verse 28. He says, come to me. Giving us direction. Where do we go? We go to Jesus. Come to me, all you who are labor and heavy laden. Translated, all you who are stressed out. Come to me, all you who are stressed out, and I will give you what? I'll give you rest. So is there stress in Jesus? No, there's rest in Jesus. I'm going to give you rest. Look, he says, take my yoke. My yoke upon you and learn from me. Take my yoke, not your friend's yoke, not your parent's yoke, not what someone else thinks you need to carry. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. So we can learn from Jesus on how to deal with stress. Let's learn from what he does. Here's what he says. For I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Anybody stressed out that needs rest for your souls, your mind, will, and emotions, we need to come to Jesus and learn from him to get rid of stress in our life. 
We'll see how he does that here in a moment. For my yoke is easy. Easy means pleasant or manageable. And my burden is light. My yoke is easy and my burdens is light. So the Father's business, the things that he's going to ask us to do, the things that he's going to initiate, they are manageable for you. The Bible tells us in Corinthians that there is nothing that's going to come upon you that you're not able to bear under. The Father's business for your life, you are able to handle it. But I had a question here about Jesus. He says, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. But then I begin to think, wait a minute, who said that? Jesus said that. This is the same guy who was betrayed by all of his closest friends, prayed in the garden, great drops of blood, he was under so much pressure, was beaten with a whip worse than anyone in history, and then hung naked on a cross to die for me, and he said, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. That doesn't sound like an easy yoke or a light burden to me. So I asked the Lord, I said, wait a minute, wait a minute, this seems like a double standard because I don't think that there's any way that that could possibly be light or easy. And he says, you don't understand. The difference is when you're motivated by a cause from within, when God is initiating, when you're motivated internally, he said the pressure or the stress from the outside cannot contain, cannot do anything, cannot compare to the pressure of what the Father is initiating on the inside. Example, when he is praying in the garden, and I don't know if you saw the Passion of the Christ, you know, and, and he was praying in the garden, and, he, and he's got the great drops of blood, and, and, the, and Satan is off on the side, and this snake is released out, and he's down there praying, and, and the snake begins to come over there, and Jesus is saying, if it's possible, Lord, take this cup from, cup from me, and the devil's getting excited. He's like, oh, he's ready to quit. He's ready to give up, and he said, but nevertheless, Lord, not your will, but my will be done, and he stands up and he looks over at Satan and he squashes the head of that serpent with his heel. And here's what God was speaking. He said, hey, the pressure of the cause of the Father overrode the stress of the moment so that he could say, that in comparison to the cause of the Father, this external stress is nothing. I will press through. I'm going to go to that cross. I'm going to redeem all these people back to the Father. The pressure of the cause meant that stress is nothing. It's not going to stop me. This is what God's wanting us to do. He's saying, listen, I don't want you to be stressed out. I want you to press in. I want you to press in. So when pressure comes against you, I don't want it to cause you to be stressed out. I don't want it to knock you out. I want you to press further. It's going to come, but you got to press in. Because you're motivated by something on the inside. So you're not letting yourself initiate. You're letting God initiate. Because pressure comes. The definition of stress, worry, anxiety is this. Mental pressure, fear, or worry caused by problems in your life, your work, etc. Real or anticipated. Real or anticipated. We have a lot of anxieties in our world today. We have a lot of conditions, anxiety disorders, and things like that, and I'm not going to minimize or uh, make insignificant any of those issues that people deal with. What I want to do is not also, on the other hand, I don't want to minimize the solution to those conditions, that those conditions are significant, those conditions are real, but the solution that's found in Jesus is also real. And so when we understand that we've got fears and stresses and disorders and anxieties that, that are coming against us, we also have a solution in Jesus that can help us deal with all those situations and walk in freedom. So I don't want to be, I don't want to be stressed out. I want, to, I want to press in and see what he has for me because the problem is not the problems themselves. It's not that uh, if you say a stress-free life means a problem-free life. Some people have this impression about about here for some reason. They say, well, hey, all you do down there is you just preach that people's not supposed to have any problems. I'm like, where does this come from? <laughs> hey, all you want down there, everybody's supposed to be healed and happy all the time. That's not bad. <laughs> There's worse things we could believe in. Jesus healed everybody. But the issue is that the world is not that if we're stress-free means I don't have any problems. We're not trying to create that kind of image that, hey, if you, this was not one of those, if you're dealing with stress, you're less spiritual messages. If you're stressed out, then you're definitely not spiritual enough like us who never have any stress. That's not what it's about. It's understanding the difference between stress coming against me and stress leading me. 
I'm going to have stress and pressure that come against me. But in those moments, i got to think, wait a minute. What is the Father initiating inside of me? And the pressure of his cause pushes me through the opposition of stress. You're going to have opposition. You're going to have resistance. As long as there's a devil loose in the earth, I'm going to have opposition to the cause that's on the inside of me. But that stress can't hold me back if the pressure is greater. The Bible says greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. That's the cause is greater on the inside of us because life is not about removing problems. It's about how we handle them. There's a saying that someone used one time that uh, it's not, life is not about what happens to you. It's how you respond to what happens to you. Things are going to happen to you. Issues are going to happen. But it's how we handle them, how we respond to that that's the key and how we deal with stress. So I want, to, I want to look at this. I want to give you an illustration for it because sometimes when we deal with worry and stress and anxiety, it's because we want to control any control freaks in the house? <laughs> Don't raise your hand. But you know, so you got the people that they feel like as long as I'm in control, then I don't have any stress. The moment I'm out of control, anxiety, stress, worry starts coming up. The moment you can't control your kids anymore. Oh, Jesus. The moment you can't control your surroundings. The moment you can't control everybody around you. Look out. Worry and stress and anxiety is going to try and build. But I want to show you something that just because sometimes we think if we're in control, we'll have less stress, it's actually the opposite. We need to put God in control. And when God's in control, we will have less stress and anxiety. See, there's a fruit of the Spirit called self-control. You cannot control your surroundings. You can't control your circumstance. You can't control other people. I know we know it, but we still think we can So we got to stop trying to control people and learn that being free from stress is not about controlling circumstances and outcomes. It's about controlling trust. Here's how we can stay stress-free when we learn to control our trust. Who I put my trust in. I'm going to put my trust in this. I'm going to trust in the Lord. I'm going to keep hoping in the Lord. I can control my trust. You can control you. You can't control anybody else. Fruit of the Spirit, self-control. So now overcoming this is important. Through, I'm going to look at it through the verse, 1 Peter chapter 5. Verse 6 says this, Therefore, humble yourselves, demote or lower yourselves into your own estimation under the mighty hand of God. Here's what I mean. I want us to go out of control where we're not initiating the activities anymore, but God's initiating the activities, so we need to demote ourselves. This is the amplified version. So demote yourself. You know one of the best things that we can do for ourselves is to fire ourselves. Fire ourselves as the boss. You know how many times as a kid you might say, well, you're not the boss of me. Anybody ever heard anybody say that? Have you heard your kids say that to somebody else? You're not the boss of me. Well, we should not be the boss of me. We need to let the Holy Spirit be the boss of me. Let him be the one who leads us and guides us. So now, yeah, that's what it means by demoting yourself, lower yourself in your own estimation, under the mighty hand of God, that in due time he may exalt you. Verse 7, casting the whole of your care, all of your anxieties, your worries, and your concerns once and for all on him, for he cares for you affectionately and cares about you watchfully. How can we get rid of some stress? or anxiety, or fears in our life, verse 7 is the key. Casting the whole of your care, all of your anxieties, your worries, your concerns. All right, I've got, I've got some props today because I want to use some of these example, example of something and how we cast our cares. Some of you fishermen and fisherwomen in the audience, you, you can know that casting involves an action. You've got to throw something, okay? So if you're going to cast your cares, I want something a little more heavy when I throw this at somebody. So now whenever you cast your cares... You've got to actually put your, you got to actually put some effort into it. You've got to throw it. Some of you got a little nervous right there. So you got, you throw it. You got to throw it. And the problem is we're not casting our cares. We're caressing our cares. We like to hold them and love them and pet them and call them George. We like to, we like to say, oh, I can, I can handle this. We get a care, we get a worry, we get an issue, and we say, you know what, I can deal with this. I, I can take care of this. But I, but I want, you sh- want you to see how God wants us to act. If I could have my, my assistant come up and help me. There are many reasons why I had a lot of anxiety and worry about using him in this illustration. <laughs> that we cannot go into at this moment. There's a lot of history built up some things I need to deal with. 
So here's the problem that when a care comes our way, immediately we begin to examine the size of the care versus our ability, and we say, you know what, I can handle this one. And we begin to say, you know what, I can handle Men probably, I won't say we're the worst, but men sometimes we have a problem because we think we're supposed to handle it. It's a man. Man. I'm a man. <laughs> right? So... I guess if you say man long enough, you really feel like you're something. But, but just, we just feel like I've got to do it. But women do the same thing. But, but women like to, we, we will hold ours and, and maybe have a different way. Women like to take theirs a little different route. And they will hide theirs maybe a little better sometimes than men do. And they're still carrying them around. But they're like, what? What? I don't, what? I don't, there's nothing. What? What? Do you, what? And again, everybody can do that. It doesn't matter what gender you are. But I'm just saying, for illustration purposes, come out of there. So you guys are really good at hiding stuff, evidently. So the problem is we, we catch, catch these, and, and at first it's really no problem. I can handle it. I can get these. But, but the problem is cares keep coming. Opportunity for stress and anxiety keeps coming in our world, right? All you got to do is watch the news for about an hour and a half, and you'll be stressed out. So the problem is the more common, you're like, okay, hey, hey, you know, I got it. You know, it's really no problem. You know, I'm, sometimes we feel responsible. Like, I'm, if I'm a responsible person, I need to deal with this. I need to handle this myself. Folks, we were not designed to carry burdens. That's what Peter's telling us here. He said, listen, you want to walk free from stress in your life? You need to learn to cast some things that are none ya. None ya business. There's things that's not our business, and we're carrying them around like we're the saviors of the world. I can fix your problems. I can fix your problem. Here, here, come on. Give me yours, too. Here, what else you got? I can do that, too. Oh, yeah, okay. I can do that. Someone else, because sometimes you don't ask for things. People just throw them at you. Somebody needs to do something about this. Somebody, somebody will come up to you and say, hey, somebody needs. Do you know what's going on? Do you know what's happening? Do you know what they did? Do you know what's going on with them? Somebody needs to do something about it. So they throw at you. Oh, so now they go home, go fast to sleep. <laughs> You're up stewing all night long. <laughs> what am I going to do? Now it's mine. What am I going to do with this? How am I going to get through it? How am I, You're stressed out, and they're sleeping like a baby. They drop something in your lap and walk off. Huh, hey, take care of that, will you? Or somebody else comes. So now another issue comes. And you're like, whoa, whoa. See, you can only hold so many. You can only carry so many things around. And this is what happens when we don't do verse 7. When we don't cast our anxieties, eventually they keep coming at you and they just start pelching you in the face. And you're like, I can't help. I can't handle. And this is how we get stressed out. And then something happens and you blow your lid. And you blow it, thank you, Diane. You, you blow your top and you blow up on your kids, you blow up on your spouse. And all of a sudden you say, well, if you knew what I was dealing with, well, maybe some of the things you're dealing with you're not supposed to be dealing with. Maybe there's some things that's not your business that you're carrying around. Maybe there's some things that you should have cast that you're carrying. And it's that one last one that makes all of them That's it. I'm done. I'm out. (laughs) What? Whoa, whoa, whoa. Time out. What happened? Nobody knew that you were carrying these around every day because you didn't show it. You don't go around telling everybody what you're carrying, but you're secretly putting stuff away all the time. And then somebody throws you something one day, and it was anything worse than the thing that you picked up two days ago, but that was the straw that broke the camel's back. That was the thing. So we've got to learn that if we're going to deal and get rid of stress and worry, and <laughs> sorry, my best. <laughs> I, <laughs> there's a lot of things I can say right now, but I'm just going to keep it. I love my assistant. <laughs> A lot of things are running around the track right now, Kevin. Just pray for me. Pray for me. (laughs) I'm laughing because it's really funny in my head. So now, but here's what he says. I want to give you a picture of what we're supposed to do. Because people's going to drop stuff on your lap this afternoon. 
If not this afternoon, tonight or tomorrow, they're going to make a post on Facebook and you're going to feel obligated <laughs> to defend yourself. You're going to feel obligated to speak to that. Is it busyness, you initiating the activity, or is it business, God initiating the activity? I don't want to initiate things on my own. I want to know what the Father, but he says, cast your cares. So when cares come, we've got to learn to cast them. Because when you cast them, I can keep catching, and I'm not overburdened. I can do it. It's not hard. I can get rid of them because I'm not holding on to anything. You can handle cares all day long because you're not holding them. But the problem starts whenever we try and hold them. As you can just keep that. But the problem is, if we... <laughs> It's like a boomerang. That's good. She don't want that care. She cast it back onto me. Praise the Lord. You're already applying the word. But this, you got to see this as whatever you want to name it. You can put a sticker on it. You can put some tape on it and write your cares on it. And you got to say, listen, I got to get rid of those. Because if it's not the father initiating that care, then you don't need to be carrying it around. I don't care who close to you says you need to do something about this. You need to handle this. It's, this is a big deal. If the Father doesn't say, then you've got to be careful what you carry around. Well-meaning people. He said to Mama, did you not know that I should be around my Father's business? Did you know that I'm going to let the Father initiate my actions from this point forward? How many of us have had trouble catching our cares? And we're, we're doing this, we're, we're picking up other people's cares because they don't care enough like you think they ought to care. Oh, come on, I'm done gone to meddling now. People, see, these are cares. Some of you, some of you don't like stuff laying around, so other people have cast their cares, and you look at their cares, and you're like, what? Would you, are you, what, are you, what are you going to do about that? Somebody's got to do something. It's not mine, but I can't, you're just going to leave it like that? What are you going to do? So you go over and you start picking up others' cares. Whoa, that was bugging me. But look what you're doing now. <laughs> See what I mean? We're picking up stuff that isn't even ours and wondering we're not, why we're not experiencing an easy yoke and a light burden. Why we're stressed out in our marriages and stressed out with our kids. Sometimes your kids don't do a thing in the grand scheme of things, but it's all the other stuff that you're holding on to that causes you to explode. Are you going to set that fork there? Are you going to set that fork there? <laughs> Whew. What, what is that about? So here's what I want to do. <laughs> I want to give you an opportunity. Here's what I felt like the Lord is speaking to me. Because we have cares. We have real things, okay? This is... This is fun and it's good to talk about, but the seriousness is we all have things that we're facing every day. Things that are significant. And so what do we do with them? We've got to learn to be a caster of our cares. Because when someone throws something to you, you've got to take that and you've got to say, okay, Father, boom, this is yours. Now, is there a cause in this issue that you want to initiate for me? Because sometimes God will speak through other people and give you something, and it is something for you to do. But you've got to always take things that people throw at you and say, wait a minute, is this the father initiated, or is this my mother-in-law, or is this my mother, or is this my dad, my cousin, my friend on Facebook? Is it, who is it that's initiating? So you begin to take this care as you say, wait a minute, is this a cause that has Chad Everett's name on it to get involved with, or is this just a wonderful cause that somebody's going to do a great thing about, but I need to cast that on the Lord, because if I will give it to him, then then he can give it to the right person. But as long as I'm carrying it around, mine, 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 mine. Well, there's somebody who has a passion and a skill set and a grace. There's some things that we're doing that we don't have a grace for, and we're wondering why we're frustrated. You got to know your cause. So here's what I want to do. I want to give you an opportunity to cast some cares. I would love to have us have an opportunity for you to come one at a time and write something on here and throw it down. But we don't have time. But I want you to picture your care as this ball. And I want to give you a chance to cast some cares today. If you would, just bow your heads with me. I want us to seek the Lord. I want us to see what he's saying. 
I don't know what your cares are. I don't know what your worries are, your anxieties, your stresses. I'm not making light of any of them. I think they're all significant. But we've got to find out what things are initiated by the Father and what things are not. Holy Spirit, come. Speak to every heart. Show them the cares that they're carrying that they have not cast. Reveal it to them. I believe as the Holy Spirit is speaking to you, whether you're watching online or listening by CD, I believe God's speaking to you about cares that you need to cast. And I want you to do that. I want you in a moment of prayer right here, I want you to say, Father, I give that to you. I'm not going to carry that around. That's not my responsibility. That is not my business. That's not my purpose. That's not my cause. That's not my assignment. That's not my objective. That wasn't initiated by you. That was initiated by my worry. That was initiated by my fears. So I lay it down. Why did you search for me anxiously, Mom? Why didn't you seek me prayerfully? Why didn't you pray and ask the Father? You sought me for four days, distressed, tormented. Why? Why did you not just ask the Father? Why did you not pray and trust Him to show you the answer? Only natural, we might think, but God's giving us a formula on how to walk free. So cast those cares. I'm going to pray for you. And I want you to agree with that. I believe it can be a powerful moment of exchange where you lay down the stress, the worry, the anxiety of your life and to cast those over unto God. Father, I thank you for the power of your word. I thank you for the power of the Holy Spirit. God, I believe that you died so that we could walk free from the pressure and the burden the yokes that don't come from you. So Lord, I ask you to forgive me for taking on cares that are not my own. Forgive me for taking on causes that are none of my business. Forgive me, God. I want to change my mindset today and I want to cast all the cares, all the worries, all the anxieties off of myself. I want to cast them onto you, God, because I know you care for me. You love me. So I receive your love in place of my cares, in place of my worry, in place of my stress. I receive the love of God. I believe, Lord, that it's more responsible to receive your love than it is to carry my cares. I'm not irresponsible to trust you, God. I'm irresponsible when I trust myself. So I pray, Lord, that today we will cast all of our cares onto you every day. I say that because this is not a one-time thing. This is something you may have to do hourly. Cast the care. As fast as it's thrown at you, as fast as you've got to cast it. It doesn't mean you don't do responsibilities or don't handle things. It just means that you only do what the Father initiates. Father, I just pray for my friends today that you show us how to walk free from the prison of stress, worry, and anxiety. Doesn't mean we won't have problems. I get it. But Lord, I believe that you will give us a pressure on the inside that will override the stress on the outside. I believe you put a cause on the inside of us that's greater than the opposition outside of us. So I thank you, Father, for freedom today to cast our cares and to trust you. In the darkest of times, in the hardest of times, Lord, we trust you with all of our heart. I praise you, Lord, because you're worthy.